here, Gerald Brown, here in Heavy in the Paint, another episode. And next guest right now is a gentleman I truly, truly lean on to really know the ins and outs, the realness associated with college basketball as well as the NBA. It's an honor and a privilege to always call him a friend, the legendary Mr. One and Only, Coach Jerry. Coach, what's going on? Great to have you on the show. Um, lots going on in, 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 in the state of Kentucky. Uh, Busy. Yeah, busy. It's busy. First and foremost, let's work backwards. The earliest news, obviously, it's now official that uh, John Calipari has decided to move on from Kentucky to Arkansas. Yes. How surprised were you in regards to how this happened? And better yet, how surprised are you that it happened when it did happen, as opposed to not some time after the final or the games or so? Well, I wasn't surprised at all, Jero. When they lost to Oakland, I announced uh, that Monday um, that I thought Coach Calipari would be leaving University of Kentucky. Twofold. A lot of pressure from the fans the last four years. They had not performed to the level that the standards that Coach Cal had set his first six years at Kentucky were unbelievable. Four Final Fours, a national championship in 2012. But in uh, 2017, 2019, he had Final Eight appearances. But after that, it's been a drought. And we all know that Coach Cal uh, runs his own ship. He did not let uh, the University of Kentucky nor the administration steer him from what he wanted to do. So there was a strain on the program the last year and a half, two years, especially after the St. Peter's loss. There was a serious strain on the program. So when they lost to Oakland, I knew myself, my personal opinion, I'm really good friends with Coach Cal, is that his time in Kentucky was up. Not that they would fire him, but Gerald Brown, I've done this all my life, and you've been around it all your life now. Coaches have a timeline. There's an expiration date on our contracts. There'll be no more 20-year coaches, not in today's game. People mm. that are there, Drew at Baylor, yes, people that have really resurrected programs will stay as long as they want. But no, it's not going to happen anymore, and it was time for Coach Calipari to leave. Now, he decides to leave on, and then once he decides to leave, how surprised were you? that it was Arkansas because the biggest thing was, and this is how it always works in college basketball, the domino effect. So, mm -hmm. you know, there have been talks that Andy uh, Enfield would decide to move on and, mm -hmm. and he was going to SMU. Yes. Very tough place to win in, in the Pac-12. Well, now Big Ten with USC in, in, in a football school. And really his time, like you alluded to, had just come and gone. But him deciding yes. to take the SMU job, we start this sort of, uh, if you will, the calendar five-year deal. He goes mm -hmm. to the ACC, and then all of a sudden, Eric, Eric Musselman opens up Arkansas going to the USC job. Do you think that if that domino wouldn't have fallen, that Cal would have remained at Kentucky this year? And would it have made things very difficult, especially how things have transpired? I do think that if it wasn't the right situation, he would have done one more year at the University of Kentucky. But there was a strain. There were a lot of things going on. Uh, sidebars. Coach Calipari wanted to hire his son, which got fired with Coach Stackhouse at Vanderbilt. University of Kentucky didn't want that. Okay, they did not. They didn't think the fans would look at that too kindly. Coach Cal wanted to. So that was one of the sticking points. A few other things is that they wanted Coach Cal to change some of his staff, this year's staff which Coach Cal is very loyal to his assistants. He didn't want to. So Mitch Barnhart and Coach Calipari had their little sit down that everyone saw on ESPN. That's the first time it's ever happened with Coach Calipari at Kentucky to let you know. That alone let me know that there was a strain on the program. And secondly, I go to Coach Cal's practices numerous times. I walked in the gym last year preseason. The first thing he told me is he, did, they meant he was referring to the administration. They, they didn't think I'd get Z in school, talking about Z Zavodimir. Isn't it? They didn't think I would get it done, and I did. And if you remember, everyone was wondering why it took so long. Well, University of Kentucky was part of that reason also. So there's been a lot of animosity going on between the two. So mm -hmm. I am 100% sure. I thought he was going to do one more, Gerald, but I did not. I did not think that he would be long-term at University of Kentucky. When you're right, when Musselman left to go to USC, great location, a lot of money, big time boosters. It didn't surprise me at all that he was leaving. A lot of people say, what a step down. 
Not really. If you look at Coach Musselman's last five years compared to Kentucky's, they were better. Okay? They were better. Arkansas, Nolan Richardson has won an NCAA championship. So he's not going to a place where he has to resurrect it. They packed that gymnasium. They've got serious money there. I mean, serious money. And I don't see it an issue. I think it's right now. And this is part of the problem with Coach Cal. Looks to me it's a lateral move because Arkansas had stepped just like Alabama, just like LSU. A lot of teams in the SEC had stepped to the level of Kentucky. Look at the last five years now. Last SEC championship was what, 2018, 17? Somewhere in there. So I don't see it as a step down. I see it as a lateral move. And I think that he will flourish there. I really do. Now, the next step in, in sticking with Arkansas and just this move here, I think the biggest thing is now, you know, in this transfer portal era that we all in in, in college basketball, mm-hmm. the kids that are going to leave from Kentucky. Have you heard anything with regards to the kids? Like we know the young man, Bradshaw, I think that he was already a foregone conclusion. He was going to go yes. in the portal regardless. But the kids, uh, the big Z, he's gone. He's yes. in the portal. But DJ Wagner, uh, the young man, Dillingham, has already applied yes. for the draft. Dillingham's already going, yes. He's already yeah, hired he's an agent. Draft. He's out. What do yes. you think in terms of those kids migrating and the, 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 the recruits? Do you think those U.K. recruits will now follow? Carter Knox has already said. Carter Knox has already gone. Right. So one of them has already gone to Kentucky. I do think, let's go to DJ Wagner. Foregone conclusion, I can't see him not following Coach Calipari to Arkansas. I just can't see it. Um, I do not see him staying at the University of Kentucky. That's first and foremost. Um, I'm not saying that he shouldn't, but I don't see that happening. That's mm-hmm. So now we're talking about Edwards, which uh, I haven't heard 100% yet on what Edwards is going to do. I saw him in the draft lottery somewhere around 46 to 50 in the preliminary draft lottery, so I'm not sure what he will do with that. But everyone... I hate this, but kids are going to Kentucky because of the relationship with Coach Calipari and what he can do for them to get them directly into the NBA. That's why kids go to Kentucky the last 15 years. That's why. And he's done a tremendous job. Look at all the maximum contracts that he has. I just don't see those players staying. I see them leaving. And I see a lot of them following Coach Cal to Arkansas, being honest with you. That's why Coach Kentucky has to, and I'm telling you right now, there will be a press conference Friday. I'm just telling you now, there'll be a press conference Friday, University of Kentucky, and I'm 99% sure they're going to announce Scott Drew. Mm, Yeah, yeah, definitely. Scott Drew leaving Baylor to take on that role at Kentucky. Um, Coach, we witnessed the whole situation when Patino went back to play Kentucky and Lexington, Mm -hmm. this might be a little similar to that because (laughs) Arkansas is always on the schedule and he's going to have to go back to Lexington to play that. How do you think that's going to be? Because in in some regards, I don't think that will be that contentious because they wanted him gone. (laughs) You know, I I don't think – with Patino, they wanted him there and he left and he went to Louisville. So – you know, go to the NBA and then come back and go to Louisville. Right. I don't think it would be that contentious as I'm thinking about it. Well, no. What do you think? Kentucky fans always want to be on top. If Coach Calipari comes back there and pops the cats, they're not going to like it. And I'm telling you, he can't wait to pop the cats. <laughs> <I'm telling laughs> you. you can trust me. Coach Calipari's already marked that date, and it's going to be very, very contentious. I, I'll be at that game. I wow. guarantee you. Wow. That's what I'm going to go see. Wow. Yes. It, it, it's definitely going to be one of those things. Now, on the flip side of that, you just mentioned, obviously, Scott Drew is going to take over that program. Mm-hmm. How surprised are you? Because we heard mega names that were thrown out from, you know, uh, Jay Wright, yes. uh, who uh, Billy Donovan all said no. Early. Mm-hmm. Early, Nate Oates, everybody. Uh Surprised? How surprised are you that he's taking that job, especially what he built in at Baylor? And clearly, it's probably going to be similar monies, but now he's stepping into a pressure cooker like uh, UK. How surprised are you? I am surprised. Uh, he will get a raise. Uh, I heard it's going to be a six-year, fifty-one million dollar deal, eight and a half million a year, which is a raise. 
but is a pressure cooker. He was comfortable at Baylor. He had everything he wanted in Waco. It, he is stepping going to a different animal now. That's all that I can say. I played him when he was at Baylor when I was at North Carolina A&T. He's a fine coach. He's done a tremendous job. He resurrected Baylor to a national championship from absolutely nothing to a national championship. You have to give him credit for that. But this Kentucky job is a different job. Twofold, though. It gets him closer to home. Come on, guys. Airplane ride is not that far. Waco, <laughs> Dallas, Texas. Uh, I mean, Lexington from home. But it does put him in a different light. If he can win a championship at the University of Kentucky, he'll go down as one of the greatest coaches. He could win another one at Baylor, and they'd be like, okay, great, two championship at Baylor. But it would not give him the recognition that the University of Kentucky job will give him. So uh, he's stepping into a pressure cooker, but there is a huge upside if he does take Kentucky back to a Final Four and win a national championship, he'll go down with his, one of the all-time greats. Yeah. Now, you know, with the way, you know, the, the transfer portal is right now, and obviously you can go in, gone are the days, you take a transfer, you're going to have to sit out, and you know mm -hmm. what, teams and fan bases and boosters are patient that first year. That's not going to be the case at, <laughs> at Lexington at UK. They're going to expect Scott Drew to come in there how much pressure do you think he's going to walk into there, the expectation for this team, probably to win a championship in his first year? They'll give him a year, but they weren't going to want it. They're not going to give him much more than that. They'll, he's he's stepping into boiling water. Gerald, the water's hot. Ooh. Lexington, they've gone through a drought, which people don't understand. Lost to St. Peter's. Got me? Second game, lost to Kansas State. Lose to Oakland. Mm. nine wins the year before that. They've been in a drought at Lexington, a huge drought. So, no, they're like vampires. They want blood. They want <laughs> blood, and they're going to need it quickly. Now, I do think press conference will be Friday. I'm 99% sure. And he will get right to work at trying to keep some of these recruits. His playing style is very similar to Coach Calipari's. He loves to get up and down. He's got very active, strong guards with the ball. He wants to play fast. So I think he'll be able to hold on to a, a few more recruits than we think, but it's still not going to be what he needs it to be this year. His second year, I really do see him having a run at it and trying to, you know, interrupt that SEC flow. Alabama's starting to raise its head. Nate Oates. Yeah. Bruce Pearl at Auburn trying to raise his head. You know, right now, the SEC, even though they do not perform well in the NCAA tournament, it always surprises me. But during the regular season, the SEC is tough, really yeah. tough. They just seem to fold in the uh, NCAA tournament. That's a tough conference right now. So for him to break the top three, he's going to have to really perform. I mean, Drew is stepping into a pressure cooker. I don't – I thought he would stay at Baylor. I just did not expect this move. I really thought that University of Kentucky would get Billy Donovan, who I thought was the match, the perfect match, could handle them. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Now, on the flip side of that, Coach, uh, Jerry Eves joining me here in Heavy in the Paint. Let's go to your alma mater. They got a new coach, and Pat Kelsey mm -hmm. coming from mm -hmm. College of Charleston. He said all the right things. You yes. know, some people say he's won the press conferences. He's uh, gotten recruits in there. Do you think that this now with, if you will, the state of Kentucky's up. It's open mm -hmm. up for grabs, if you will. And it's essentially an even playing field, if you will, because Scott Drew's going to come in there. He's going to try to settle everything down. He's going to need to take some time. Same thing with Pat Kelsey's going into a situation. How much more pressure do you think this happening puts now on the shoulders of Pat Kelsey at the University of Louisville? This situation here is going to take time, Gerald. Um, everyone knows that I was a Kenny Payne man, advocate of Kenny Payne. I do understand why the University of Louisville had to move on. I do. I understand this business. I've been in it over 35 years, Gerald. Mm -hmm. um, but Louisville is not a quick fix. And I've told its fan base on my radio show, on all the TV stations, I've been on all of them. It's time now for the Louisville fan base to back a coach. They're going to have to backpack Kelsey. It's going to take three or four years. 
for him to build this program back. Mm -hmm. It's going to take the fan bases. They're going to have to understand that now they're going to have to show the country why we think we're one of the best fan bases in the country. They're going to have to pack the Yum Center. They're going to have to come no matter what the score is of the record. They're going to have to show recruits that they will support no matter what. Because after the Kenny Payne debacle, recruits and transfers saw that if things don't go well, the University of Louisville City will turn on you. It did. It turned on its own, Kenny Payne. They don't have that anymore. They're going to have to support. So I think it's going to take Pat Kelsey three years to turn this around. I think he's a fine young man. He's never been at this level, but he's an excellent coach. He's a good X and O guy. I think that his charisma is beautiful. I think he did say all the right things at the press conference also. I think he'll do a fine job, but it's going to take him some time. It's not Drew at Kentucky. He's not a national champion, and he's never been a national champion, and the expectations should be different. Bottom line is Scott Drew's going to make $8.5 million, and Pat Kelsey's going to make $2.3 million for a reason, and Louisville's going to have to let him grow with the job. Yeah, because you say three to four years, even in this era with the transfer portal, you still believe it takes that long to really – like, I mean, again, when uh, I'm, I'm not talking about national championship, but mm -hmm. at least – Somewhere close to 20 wins, right? I mean, depending on schedule. No, no, no. 20, now you're saying yes. Years, like two what, years. Two, two years. years. He could win 18 to 20 games, yes. And I thought you were talking about – I'm talking about my standards at the University of Louisville. Daryl Griffith's standards. Right. Peter Rodney McCray, Daryl right. Smith, Wiley Brown, Purvis Ellison. Those standards was Final Four a bust. Right. We've come right. a long way from that, Jerry. Mm -hmm. uh, Louisville fans have forgotten what it used to be in the 70s, just think Denny Crum, 72 Final Four, 75 Final Four, 80 Championship, 82 Final Four, 83 Final Four, 86 Championship. You understand? Louisville was the team. That's where their parents used to be. The younger fans have lost their way. They believe we're good, but those aren't the standards they live by. They took a second standard, being honest with you. But yeah. They're going to have to give Coach Kelsey time. But 20 wins year two, I could see him winning 18 to 20 games. Yes, year two. But that's still not a national championship. No. That's not no. what we're about. No. I, I mean, I'm saying for a national championship, four years, Gerald. Four yeah. years. Four years. That's not bad. Coach, I no. want to ask you this in terms of just, and we have talked about this on, 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 on the show, on the radio show, in, in terms of just the landscape of college basketball, Mm -hmm. And 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 first of all, when you look at this dynamic of the transfer portal, you know, has it hurt or helped college basketball? And we know that it's great that kids in NIL and the kids having the ability to be able to move because coaches are moving. I get all that. But overall, when you look at the game now, has it been hurt somewhat by the transfer portal? Because coaches are realistically – there used to be a time, Coach, and obviously you coach when – you say, okay, look, if you lost out on a kid that you were recruiting and he chooses to go somewhere else, especially if he's in your conference or something, you're going to see that kid's success for the next three to four years. But now if you lose out on a kid, you're probably just saying, well, I could probably get him next year. Because Absolutely. Coach, yeah, are re-recruiting <laughs> kids every year. Is that good for the game itself and the growth of college basketball? Gerald, it all works out in the wash. As a former player, two Final Fours, one national championship, I got robbed. That's all there is to it. It's time to pay the players. I don't want to hear anybody. I told you on your show before, I don't want to hear that junk about is hurting the game. No, coaches, right. coaches have been leaving forever. It does not hurt the game. Right. It will all work out, come out. It will come clean in the wash. I'm so glad the kids have an opportunity to earn some money that they've made. Now, Will Congress step in and put some guide rails on this thing because the NCAA did not do its job for all those years? Yes, they tried to keep kids in the slavery mentality that going to school and getting an education was well worth it, which was ridiculous completely. Again, I told people, if you're an opera singer, you could go to college, you could get a scholarship, and you could sing anywhere in the world. But when you're a basketball player, football player, all these guidelines came in, which was completely, totally ridiculous. They should have never, ever been in play. So, Jerry, you shouldn't have been used to it because they shouldn't have done it. But now that they have, we're all talking about, has it hurt the game? No, the game is just making a correction. 
is going that 180, which it has to do. It will work out. Good coaches like Hurley will be understand how to bring the right players to their program. You just mentioned that you can turn your program around a lot faster now. You can. So there's a lot of benefits to what's going on also. It's not always all negative. There is some positive to this. So no, Gerald, it will slow down when kids are receiving what they think they should receive. They're playing the style of basketball that they were told when they were recruited. Jerry, you got to understand. You can talk to numerous players. Jerry's isn't one of them. Coach Crum didn't promise me a thing. Nor did I was a McDonald's All-American. I was in play, promised one second playing time, not one second. But he said, we'll play a certain style. You can fit that style. If you improve as a player, you'll be very good. It worked out for me. But how many players play pro? One in a million. You got me? It doesn't work out for most, Gerald. So now when players go to schools that is not the correct fit for them because coaches did not tell them the truth, uh, coaches do lie, Gerald. Let me just tell everybody, make sure you post it strong. Coaches do not tell the truth. They're not all great people. They do not have integrity, and they're not worried about the players. So I'm glad, I am happy as hell that the kids can move around, finally. So when someone tells them an untruth and their family, they can find a place that is a better fit for them. Only issue is this. We know when you transfer a lot, and I would tell the parents, they need to put people on like Butch Beer, Jerry Eves to tell them, just like you know. BJ Armstrong, friends of yours. When you transfer, your credits don't go with you. Mm. That's the issue. That's a regular student. So this is not a issue about a student athlete. If a regular student goes to the University of Kentucky and transfers to Purdue, Purdue is not going to accept all their credits. You got me? They're not. So understand that as you move, you're making it to where it's going to be harder for you to graduate. That they need to know. That is an issue that falls on the athlete and their family, not the schools. But I'm glad the kids can transfer. It will work itself out. Well, now it seems like, you know, again, I agree with you on that. The, the, the one area where I, I think it really the, the, that suffers, it hurts more than anything, is the freshmen, the, the, the high school kids. Oh, the because high school. Oh. The high school kids are being told that, you know what, as crazy as it makes out, you're too young. Like old is the new thing in college basketball where you could say uh, you're too young. If you're 17, 18, if you 18 graduate, nah, you got to go find some way to develop and go somewhere. And yeah, it, look, I'm happy that, you know, all the young people are getting paid. But coach, we had a college, a women's college final four or, or a sweet 16 elite eight game, excuse me, going into the final four. Mm -hmm. In which the numbers from the the whole Final Four, they they, they smashed the men's Final Four. Yeah, the Nielsen and, ratings. Yeah, yeah, and the ratings and stuff like that. In terms of the game itself, when you look at the women's game, how surprised are you at what Caitlin Clark was able to do and this magical run that went on in the NCAA tournament to the national championship game? No, uh, you must give her. When she smashes Pistol Pete Mayer for the scoring record, people don't want to give that girl her due. She's really, really good. Okay, Gerald? But I hate for people to forget, Angel Reese was sitting on the other side of that calendar, knocking it down also. What a matchup last year, two years ago in that championship game when LSU came out on top. That really promoted the game. Then both players come back, stay at their schools, and respectively, they're pushing. Both people are pushing. You've got Iowa pushing. you got LSU pushing. You've got my girl Dawn Staley at South Carolina pushing. They, it was a cosmic storm that hit strong in, in women's athletics, and I'm glad to see that. And, yes, they had one of the highest-ranked games ever, which was good. But I throw that back to the men, Gerald. I don't hold the women back. I'm glad the women have now taken a big step forward to where they'll be able to demand more TV money from ESPN, CBS, ABC. The deal is the men. We play a bad style of basketball, Gerald. Mm. They Preach. dribble too dang much. Preach. You know, I always said, I think you kept me off your NBA TV radio thing because I wasn't happy about my league. No, I think uh, you're going to uh, hold uh, me uh, back, uh, Gerald. You're holding no, me back. Rick Mahorn, no, hold no, me back. No. <laughs> Rick, I told Rick Mahorn, Butch Beard, and I did probably a month ago. Dribble too much. The game is boring. That's all there is to it. You've got ball-dominant people that keep the ball all game. It's not fun to watch. Look at 
Hurley. And look at what they did. No one wants to say it and hasn't said a word about it. They move the ball. They pass it. They don't dribble it. They don't over dribble the ball. Look at everyone else. All the way to Coach Calipari. I love him. He's going to come on my radio show in a day or two. Bottom line is that dribble drive has screwed up the game. You have too many ball hogging players. Then you've got some of the new wave players. I'm saying the last 15, 20 years. Look at what we do. Look what we can do off the dribble. It is a look at me game. It is not a Larry Bird, Magic Johnson team game. Ball move, people scored. Dennis Johnson, Paris, you had tons of great players. Kevin McHale, it wasn't just Larry Bird. So truly, the game's not fun to watch. They can say, look at the and one effect. Yeah, I like to watch James Harden dribble the ball 35 times. I play pro. He's a super talent, but I don't want to watch it. I'm sorry. Mm. And a lot of people are saying the same thing. Look at the NBA ratings, Gerald. They're awful. But nobody, because our commissioner will not step to the forefront and tell them it's time to throw that junk out with the bathwater. It's not fun to watch. Well, it's not. It's, even it's not. Coach. I think the biggest thing is, is that the growth of coaching, you know, analytics yeah. play such a role in it now. Well, where do you have your Cotton Fist Simmons? Where do you mm -hmm. have your Hubie Browns? Where Bill Fitch. Mm -hmm. Bill Fitch. Where do you mm -hmm. have your teachers of the game? You don't have that now in the game. It's more analytical. It's more of this whole thing, pace and space, the teaching of the game, and it can trickle down onto the AAU level. It mm -hmm. has it's, it's, it's disappeared because, like you said before, pace and space and all this other stuff has replaced ball movement, has replaced execution. I mean, you hear Rick Patino, you know, talking a press conference about having to go over a certain period of time teaching his players to uh, yes. know how to throw a bounce pass. Exactly. That's just, you know where the game is at. I don't know how the game got here. Gerald, bottom line, they don't even have <laughs> – all they need to do is put one camera on the guy with the ball because everybody else is standing in corners watching. Dan Tony brought this game. People thought it would be effective. Shoot threes or layups or free throws. You'll see what happened. Nothing's happened. He's had good players. He's had good teams, but they haven't won a thing, period, point blank. AAU effect, we need to throw AAU 99% of it out because coaches aren't trained. We don't have Coach Wilkins anymore. We don't have the great NBA coaches, ball movement coaches, setting screens, Bobby Knight, moving without the ball. You don't see that anymore. You see, well, how many years has it taken? We had Edie, finally, two dominant big men. Yes. Playing in the championship game. It had been Patrick Ewing and Akeem Olajuwon. If you couldn't shoot a three-pointer, they didn't want to play you. We've almost lost the big men. I tell people all the time, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Gerald, listen to me, is still the greatest of all time. And let me tell you why. Over Will, Coach? But He's the greatest of all time. Let me tell over you. Over Will. Over Will. Ooh. Over Mike. And I'm a Michael Jordan lover. I, I know that. I didn't say Mike. I'm just talking about Will. Because, you, know, yeah. you know, I get upset. And, and, and the thing is, I told you before, I get upset when somebody mm -hmm. said uh, that, you know what, uh, Will, Will was pretty much, they said uh, Steph Curry replaces Will on the top 10 all-time okay. list and stuff. And I, 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 you know what, it almost, I almost lost my mind behind I it. didn't say that. I didn't no, say no, that. no, when you, when Steph's you, a bad boy now. Uh, Steph uh, Curry's a bad boy. I'm he's very you. bad, but he ain't, he not well now. He's he not well. well. But here's but here's what I'm telling you: why Kareem is the best of all time. Y'all can say what you want. Michael Jordan, who played with me in the 1982 Final Four, the greatest of all time. I want people to understand: Michael Jordan, James Worthy, Perkins, Kim Olajuwon, Clyde Drexler, uh, Rocket Rod Foster. Patrick Ewing, Sleepy Floyd, all the players, Derek Smith, Rodney McCray, Scooter McCray, Jerry Ease, Milt Wagner. There's not one close. You got me? Not one. There'll never be one. The bottom line is no one. Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant. No one shoots the sky hook. Yeah. He has not been replicated ever. Not close. Mm. He scored 30,000 points with a shot nobody else can do. Mm. And until somebody can replicate it, He's the greatest of all time. You got me? Because nobody, nobody can replicate what he did. 
Nobody. There's a mirror image of everybody that's been through the league. You know, we talk about LeBron James. No question. Great talent. But there was George McGinnis in the 70s and 80s. Ooh. You got me? 6'8", 235 pounds in high school, shooting the ball with one hand, big, strong guy. He just didn't get to dribble as much. Do you understand me? Well, there have been players that have been like the players of today. But nobody's been like Kareem. Nobody. That's okay. why. I don't care what anybody says until somebody duplicates the sky hook. I'm sitting on the bench at the Thomas Mack Arena when he broke the record. You got me? When he shot an 18-foot sky hook with Mark Eaton pushing him out and contesting his shot on the right baseline. I'm sitting right there on the baseline watching it in the Utah Jazz jersey. Until I see that, Gerald Brown, I'll argue with anybody. There's I think, nobody. I'm gonna argue with that. All I want to ask me? is, where do you have Will? In the top five, or you talk in big men alone? Where you want me to put it? Well, well, top five. All time or big men only? Come on, coach. All time. Come on now, coach. You straight. <laughs> come on. You know what I'm talking about. Where Hold you got up. Will? Hold up. Okay. Then here's the deal. You gotta put Willis Reed first. I mean, excuse me. You gotta put um, Bill Russell first. We have to. There's just all there's to it. You can't go anywhere without saying Bill Russell. I'm talent alone. Forget the accolade. But I mean, talent alone. Oh, Those no, no, no. Look, I respect, God rest his soul, both of them, uh, Bill Russell. Now, then then I got to say LeBron James is better than Michael Jordan. You got to win rings to be great. I'm sorry. But, but, but You'd be Will, good. Coach, You'd be good. Coach, he still got records on and off the court that still stand now. Who? Will Chamberlain. I know, without a doubt. 100 points. Yeah. still stand today. And, and, I'll put him off the court too. <laughs> <laughs> we got leave that alone. This is a I, I know I'm leaving alone, but I'm saying, PG. but I'm saying, okay. it, 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 oh know, god, that, I'm putting thing. I'm putting him in the second five. Is that fair? Ooh. Second five. I've got Kareem, Magic, Mike, got me, LeBron, got me. Ooh. Man, that number five is rugged. I don't know it isn't. I don't care what anybody says. Without a doubt, it's the Mamba, Kobe Bryant. Oh no, Coles, Coles, you can't what? put. You not putting Bird in there? I didn't so, put Bird so, in there. I had to go so with Elijah Wan. Go Elijah Wan. So so Will goes in there with Elijah Wan. Yes, Bird, Malone, Bird, Jerry West, oh, Moses Malone, Elgin yeah. Bella, Elgin. I like Elgin, but he ain't in that group. He's good, but name. Ooh. Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, Magic. Ooh. Guys, just think of this. Magic's my era also. They win it the year before. They win it in 79. I win it in 80 with Daryl Griffin. He goes in the league right away. He's a superstar coming in 82. But that's my era. That's my guy. If that boy doesn't go down with AIDS, he's got every assist record. It ain't close. Forget it. He'd have had more championships too. Forget it. Come on, man. Not close. So people like to bump I'm Magic. I understand Kobe, though. I, I mean, God rest his soul. Kobe, I'm like. <laughs> Yo, the mama? Man. Hey, that's a bad man, boy. It was a bad. But Bird, you know, Kobe, and this is the thing. This is right up my alley because you know what? we, You know, getting on the air and talking about the legends and stuff like that of the game. Because in this era, it's unfortunate because people live. We live in a microwave era where people mm -hmm. think, you know, basketball and stuff like that, if it doesn't exist past five years, that's so, foreign to them. And yes. I just think that is such a sad thing when you talk about scores and guys that were so talented. I mean, George Iceman Gervin, people don't Ooh. even think about when you talk about all-time great scores. No question. You know, and some of the talented players that have played the NBA. And, and, and you're right, in your era and stuff like that, I mean – I, I Pistol got Pete Maravich. Pistol Pete Maravich. Come on now. 6'6". Six, 6'6 six. Six, six in the 60s. Doing I'm, things that... So, yes, I, we got Kevin Durant. I'm glad. Yes. Because you had Pistol Pete in the 60s at 6'6 six, six, doing remarkable things. But I'm going to throw this out before I let you get on out of here. Okay. If he didn't have his issues, I think the sugar man would have been right up there real close in that conversation. Michael Ooh. Ray Richardson. Man, I'm still scared oh. of Michael Ray. <laughs> I'm still scared of Michael Ray, baby. <laughs> hey, I, I, hey, let me tell you what. 
between he and Ray Williams, Gus and Ray, Mount Vernon boys, Scooter and Roddy. You know, I know them both. Yes. But I'm going to tell you, Ray, I was scared of Ray and Michael. Ooh. Them two. I'm like, God. <laughs> <laughs> you sure I didn't want to play either one of them. Yes. Yes. A monster on that card. I'm tough. telling you. Oh man. Hey coach, uh where everybody can hear your 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 show every day and stuff like that. 790. Right. Yes, 790 WKRD iHeart Media AM 7 to 8 in the morning. Eve Sports Radio. I'm getting ready to send Coach Calipari's assistant a message to find out what day he'll be able to come on with me. But yes, I had and let me tell you what. I thought Coach Huggins had gotten the job off my show. I thought Louisville was going to hire Coach Huggins. And he was on my show with me two weeks ago right. asking for the job, Gerald. Yeah. Ask how many times does that happen? Wow. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, but you know, Gerald, you know you gave me my break. I tell everybody. No, no. no Gerald no, Brown gave me my break. He big time. No. no he big time. He, he, he and Rick Bowen both. Stop Gerald gave me my break, that, Gerald. Man. Listen. Appreciate oh, you, bro. I, I always appreciate you. You coming up for the uh, the draft? Oh, I'll be in Chicago again. I'll be in New York again. Yep, you definitely. Well, ho hopefully you'll be draft Chicago, New hopefully, York for the draft. Hopefully you don't forget the small people this time when you come up to New York. Like you now did. Let me, you let me come up to Satellite. Let me come up on that 38th floor with you again, sit next to you and Rick and everybody. You and oh. Penny. You know, let me go sit next to the superstars. <laughs> Anytime you want. He is the coach, Jerry Eves, joining me, heavy in the paint.